Welcome to Four Speed Ahead. I'm Craig Fuller here with Jim Swift, the CEO of Corterra. Jim, how are you today? Doing great, Craig. How are you? Doing well. So Corterra is a business that is providing inf credit information uh, across the supply chain. Tell us a little bit about the foundational uh, story of the company. Yeah, so I, I grew up in the consumer side of the world trying to figure out credit risks around consumers and, and how to acquire them as customers and and built uh, this uh, expectation of what's possible with analytics. And then I saw in the B2B world just how, uh, how handicapped we all are in that. So uh, this is my second startup now. The last one uh, was all about information, about people and businesses. That was successful. So then I created this company, and it's all about understanding what's going on with businesses because we've always struggled with, with knowing who we interact with, whether it's a prospect or a customer, uh, whether we're trying to sell to them or manage risk associated with them, whether it's a supplier, you know, wherever we go, we really struggle with understanding who we're interacting with. So I'm doing something about it now. So you've built a, a database of, of the of supply companies that are involved in supply chain purchasing, uh, shippers as we, we like to call them, uh, and your customers uh, intersect all elements of supply chain, do they not? Yeah, yeah, really manufacturers, distributors, retailers, transportation companies, uh, and all the other companies that are involved supplying to those types of businesses. You know, you really need to look, they're all moving parts together. So you need to be able to understand how things ripple through the, the various supply chains because changes in one area can impact another one. So we need to we need to have really deep understanding of what's going on with these businesses. And historically, we just have been guessing really uh, about what was gonna happen. We're talking to our customers and, and trying to make decisions through tribal knowledge. So the uh, what's happening in supply chain with uh, a, you know just massive disruptions? I imagine that companies are scrambling for new suppliers. Uh, transportation companies are getting uh, a lot of activity in the market. What is what is it you're hearing from your customers? Well, we see a lot in our data. You know, we track about 1.7 trillion dollars in spend between businesses in the U.S. There's there's about eight trillion dollars overall in B2B spend in the U.S. We're tracking a huge portion of that. And so since the, the pandemic in particular, we've really watched because things have been thrown out of whack in several areas. And we've seen lows that, that hit in April and May. And manufacturing took a beating. They were down 20 plus percent in their year over year spending. You know, we're tracking the non-payroll spend. So what they spend on transportation, what they spend on materials and equipment and everything else. And so we saw that drop 20 plus percent, as I mentioned. And now after five months of ratcheting back up just in, in October, it got back about where it was in October of 2019. So big disruptions there. It varies by industry though within that. You know, food manufacturing has had to shift and pivot from moving product into restaurants to moving product into grocery stores. Other areas like information technology, we're seeing those manufacturers, they're, they're, they're having increases year over year. And then other areas like transportation equipment, uh, machinery, fabricated metals, other sectors within trans within manufacturing are having a hard time. Within distribution, um, we've seen that uh, look more like a roller coaster, and distributors have responded. You know, one of the, the things I love about uh, distributors and transportation companies is is the resilience that they have. You know, if you think of the shortages that we we avoided in completely shifting massive portions of how we eat from restaurants to going to grocery stores and picking things up, it's pretty remarkable that the shelves weren't empty of everything. You know, that speaks to all the, the packaging providers and the distributors and the, the transportation companies that are moving things in new ways. So the manufacturers have rebounded. Transportation is up about 5% overall spending by transportation companies over last year. Um, and I expect that to continue to, to go up in the next couple of months. Yeah, it's amazing how resilient the supply chain is. I remember going into a grocery store in March and meat, uh, you would, the grocery aisles didn't have meats and other, uh, you know, staples. And you would go back the next day and they would be completely full. And, and folks that are not in the industry were in many ways panicked because they didn't realize how resilient the supply chain is. But in many ways, not only was it uh, impacted by what happened during the COVID, uh, initial days of the COVID crisis, but it was in many ways the first responders, or we like to say the always responders. Yeah, and an area like packaging is one that really highlights that. It's an underappreciated part of the world, but, but if you think about it, the way that manu food, manufacturers of food had to change their packaging to go from a restaurant to the grocery store, you have to basically have smaller packaging. And so you need to gear up, you need to retool, you need to manufacture that, 
it needs to pass all of the health and safety standards, and then the manufacturers have to adopt it. They have to make their modifications. They have to change the way that the, they ship it. It, it. Amazing that we didn't have more disruption than we did. And, uh, and now we're also seeing a huge shift and increase in on, uh, online shopping, as you'd expect, right? We're, we're, we're buying everything online. And so we've seen increases year over year by internet retailers and in their spending of 30 plus percent. And we're seeing as a result, their spend on various types of freight is increasing. So they're moving a lot more product that way. And you know, capacity management and all the other things that you wrestle with as a transportation company all come into play. And we've been able to absorb that. And it feels like we're actually getting things delivered to our doorstep faster than when we were before, even though the volumes are way up. Well, for sure, consumer behaviors change. And I think the suppliers or the vendors, whether it's the retailers or the transportation providers have had have built out a lot of infrastructure. What, what is your take on in a post COVID world, uh, which you know maybe is six months, 12 months out, we have a vaccine, uh, things are start to return to a you know, life starts to return on a, a more normalized basis. What does that look like? How many of the changes that we've seen uh, in the quarantines uh, stay persistent for us as a society? I think there are a lot of different dimensions to this. What, one is that I think work from home, and you can appreciate this with running a business, I think work from home is not just going to be something we turn the page on and go back to the office full time. And we're seeing that in our data. So we, we create an index of work from home industries. Uh, things like, and they, these aren't people who are working from home, these are businesses that benefit from working from home. So things like home improvement is up. We're spending more fixing up our houses. Online shopping I mentioned is up. General merchandise stores, the Walmarts of the world, they're all up. Um, the the, the uh, pharmacies and healthcare stores are all up. And we're seeing that persist. Computer spending on IT is up and has stayed up. It's been up from 100% to 300% per month for the last five months. I thought that was just going to be a one-time blip as we gave everyone laptops and figured out how to get people working from home. But it's stayed. And so that tells you that businesses are totally reconfiguring the way that they work. And so are the way that... that that ripples through the supply chain is also going to be a factor going forward. It's not just going to come back down. In October, those businesses spent 18% more than they did in October of last year. The fact that that's hanging around, even as we have different levels of outbreak and shutdowns and everything, tells me that that's going to be a key ingredient of the new normal. You also see things, though, that are working the other way. So when you look at it, we also have an index of businesses that are tied to reopen. So things like um, anything recreation-based, uh, hotels, air travel, restaurants, they were down as much as 37% versus last year in May. They've rebounded now to get close to back to where they were, but that's probably going to come back down this month. You know, we're going to have this, this conflict between holidays and increased retail and desire to travel with more outbreak and more shutdowns. And we'll see who wins that. But I expect it'll level off or actually go back down. So I think coming out of this, you know, we're going to have different, as you mentioned, different patterns in the way people buy. I think it, we're all a lot more likely to buy food online than we were a year ago and a lot of other things online. I think a lot of businesses also have realized that they can change their business model and it's forced them to learn how to execute in an online world. Why would they change? Why would they go back to the way they were doing it before? You know, you can have a, a smaller footprint and you can deliver to more people in more places. And if you have the, the distribution to get it to them, and you can do it profitably, it'll stick. So I think, you know, I've, I've been through the 01 recession, the 08 recession. Um, this, this is like coming out of another recession, and, and it's forced us to innovate in certain areas. There are a lot of businesses that are failing or have failed. We're seeing that failure rate go way down, though, almost approaching last year's levels, because I think the weaker businesses got weeded out early. And we're seeing a lot of new businesses being created because, you know, there's this spirit of innovation and and a lot, of, um, a lot of interest in creating new businesses in this country. And so you look around safety and health and distribution and uh, all kinds of things, technology, and all these new opportunities open up. So I think we're going to see a lot of stickiness in, uh, in the way that these curves rebound. Air travel won't be the same. They'll be down. Internet shopping will be up and stay up. Be interesting. Is it a regional element? I, I read something last night that said uh, in San Francisco, there's been 130,000 uh, 
postal request for changing addresses for people leaving the Bay Area. Uh, are you seeing anything in the data that suggests that there have been sort of regional developments or de-urbanization? Is that showing up at all? Or is it hard, is it more from your perspective, the data that you guys track, is it more based on the types of businesses uh, in the economy are the beneficiaries versus uh, the ones that are, are being impacted? We're, we don't see it yet because most of the relocation you see is the employees and businesses as opposed to the companies themselves. As the companies relocate more, then we're going to see it show up in our data. We're going to see spend um, and the composition of businesses in different states change. But right now, it's more employees in San Francisco are moving to Colorado because they can telecommute. So you have a product called Zimbles. What exactly is Zimbles and how does it work? How can it benefit folks that are in supply chain? Yeah, one of my big frustrations in the B2B world has been in understanding markets and translating that into effective sales and marketing strategies and then taking it down to execution. Almost every sales team and, and business strategy group still relies on understanding their customer base based on demographic data. What industries are they in? And how big do we think they are? And that data is notoriously inaccurate, and it's just a label. Even if it's right, two businesses of the same size aren't going to behave the same way. One might have a fleet of its own trucks. Another one might use, use a logistics firm to move all their, all their product. You can't tell that. We've always had huge blind spots in the way that we understand markets and figure out where do we want to play, where are we winning. And we used to call it lookalikes. You know, analytics was always about lookalikes. These are these are my best customers. I want to find more lookalikes like them. Mm -hmm. And so Zembles is is kind of the next generation of that. It's short for Resembles. But the idea is how can we take all this information that we have about businesses and apply the AI and machine learning on top of it so that we can help people? Because you know, people don't and businesses don't have the skill sets. They don't have PhD scientists to go and try to figure out what to do with more data. So it's about how do we go take the world beyond the demographic data that has that's just labels and it's wrong most of the time and really have more intelligence about where things are going. You know, and with COVID, you see the need for that because all of a sudden the need to move computer equipment went through the roof and you can see in our data how much air freight, air cargo capitalized on that. So you, it's it, they recognize that luckily by talking to their customers, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to have real rich analytics that we all talk about and want? And to do that, you need to have more accurate information. So we, we collect information from thousands of sources. We know about $1.7 trillion in spend. The way I think of businesses is they all have a unique spend signature. You know, you are what you buy. If, if you listed the five things you spend the most money on and I listed the five things I spent the most money on, we'd be able to really create a persona of who we are as people. And that's how the consumer analytics world works. Well, why not in the business world? So huge indicator, huge signal about a business is what do they spend money on? So Zembles, what we've done is we've, we've worked with companies for a long time to help them figure out their sales and marketing strategies and leverage our data in different ways. And we've seen them struggle with, with just having the time and the resources to be able to maximize what they get out of it. So we said, we're gonna build more AI tools so that you, know, you can go in and you can, you can basically have tools that will help you do these things faster. And so Zembles is, is, um, is a platform to really help you get the most out of a, a lot more data about the customers that you interact with. So a transportation provider that happens to do really well in a certain sector uh, could identify other customers that have similar needs or demand cycles? Yeah, and see the future. You know, it, it, we all, right now, we, we spend a lot of time looking in the rearview mirror saying, hey, this has been a strong segment for us. But especially now that the world's changing, you know, the, the spend on shipping happens after spend on other things by a business. So if I'm that manufacturing company and I'm, I'm increasing my production on computer equipment, I'm gonna start buying materials, electronics and other things. I'm gonna start investing in equipment in my factory and then I'm going to ship at some point in the future when that's ready. So there are, there are things that happen in your customer base way before you see that demand. So the ability to forecast the demand and, and change your pricing or mobilize your sales teams in different ways or your marketing efforts, you know, it, it, it's time that we had more tools to be able to look and see what's going to happen in the future. So what do you think uh, next year, moving into next year, do you think the economy stays strong or is your... Uh 
what you guys are seeing in your data, does it suggest that uh, the recovery will continue? Um, what is the outlook? And I know there's a lot of risk in that outlook because what's happened in 2020 blew up every single model, uh, at least what happened from March on. Uh, but what is your forecast uh, looking at uh, next year and beyond in terms of economic activity and recovery? So the, from a big picture, what we've seen is that overall spending on non-payroll by businesses has gotten back to last year's levels. 60% of the industries are below, but the 40% that are gainers are offsetting those losses. So overall, we're kind of back to the Mendoza line of where we were. But jobs haven't returned to the same level. So I think you're seeing a cautiousness where companies are stronger, getting stronger, but they're obviously going to be reluctant to hire because it's harder if, the, if there's a blip in the economy to deal with that. So that's a good sign. We've been watching manufacturing really closely because if we don't have manufacturing production going up, there's less to move, there's less to buy, there's less demand, but all those things are working together. And so we've seen, as I mentioned, manufacturing go from down 20 plus percent back to about where it was last year. Transportation's up 5%, retail overall is up about 13%, even though some industries like restaurants are getting hammered. So I think we're gonna continue to see more of that. The fact that business closures are, are down, the fact that overall spending is back, um, the hiring will lag. It'll come back, but we, we think that the, the, it's going to be good and it continue to improve. And the key one to watch is manufacturing. So, Jim, is a company that has the Zimbals platform has access to the data. Uh, they get advanced uh, analytics on who are the folks that are really shipping. So, if somebody perhaps uh, is shifted product cycles or has similar competitors in the market, is that really? A, the tool that's available for sales folks that are out soliciting business and trying to figure out whom they should be calling on and whom they should be identifying risks of drop-offs? Yeah, it's a big component of it. So within the within that $1.7 trillion in spend, over $300 billion of that is on shipping-related services. And some of it's fleet-related, so you can, you know, that's part of understanding your customers. Do they have a fleet? Or are they not your customer because they have a fleet? Or, you know, how does that work? And, and some are carrier-based, um, but that's over $300 billion of that. So that's great. That, that's a huge portion of it. You can really understand. You can qualify and segment and understand by industry and all kinds of different slices in, of, of the data. Uh, but then you can also look at the other related spends that are part of that spend signature for your customers and understand maybe why that's happening. You know, and that can, that, that can help you, again, capacity planning, prioritization of, of the segments that you're going after. But, yeah, we know a lot about the shipping industry. We've, that's where we started you know, when I started this 14 years ago, it was in the transportation industry. And we've expanded into the other parts of the supply chain since then. And where, where are the most of your, if you broke down your customer base, what are the typical customers that are taking advantage of the Zimbals platform? Um, it's a mix. It's everybody through the through the space, really. It's, uh, it's equipment leasing companies. It's fuel card and fuel service providers. It's carriers. It's logistics companies. Uh, it's pretty much everybody at this point. And then um, a lot of our customers are distributors. You know, they're also trying to figure out what's going on with their customers and, and trying to forecast and then through the manufacturing. So now it's everybody along the way. Jim, I gotta ask, as a venture-backed company, uh, you see a lot of activity, uh, VC uh, investments been uh, cycled, it's been going on. We're, you know, Everybody sort of assumed, or at least the uh, expectation was that 2020 would pop the bubble. What is it you're hearing? Uh, I imagine having been in supply chain, uh, your business is much hotter than it was before, or is a lot more attractive because people have now woken up to the realities of supply chain. What is your take on the current venture cycle that's out in the market? Um, it's been interesting. There are a lot of, you see the IPO market starting to heat back up. You see a lot of acquisitions. The multiples are, you know, you're looking at 10 to 14 times this year's revenue or next year's revenue in a lot of these acquisitions. So it's, it's super heated compared to where it was before. Um, I think there's a premium on data and analytics. Um, software had its run and software is, really, is obviously hot because of the predictability of the revenue. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, been really, it's been really interesting to see. Um, I, I love it. I love the appreciation that data and analytics is so fundamental to most of the, the business environments that are out there. So I don't think it's I don't think it's a fad. I think it'll uh, continue to be, you know, something that's that's a strong component of the VC world. 
But we're, being in the middle of it is it's not a bad thing. Are you seeing a change in, in VC understanding of what supply chain is? Uh, how venture capitalists uh, treat supply chain in terms of the importance of it? I think it varies. I think there's some there's some uh, VCs that are that that have caught on, and uh, and you know you see it with all the VC and private equity backed logistics companies over the last several years. It's been it's one of the it, you, you can tell when when that many smart money guys go after it. You know you you know that uh, that, that they're that they're getting it. Um, so yeah, I think to me that's that's the indicator that that they know what they're doing. It's now a hot fad being out of the bay, uh, being in supply chain, being in data. So I don't think it's a fad. I think it's fundamental. But uh, congratulations on your success and building a, a fantastic organization. Will we see a SPAC? Will we see a Cortera SPAC anytime soon? No, I don't think so. You know, I okay. think we'll, we'll just continue to build the business and and we'll see what happens. I don't think we're going to get fancy. Fantastic. Well, Jim, thank you so much for coming on Floor Speed Ahead. Uh, you can tune in to this content available on Apple TV and Freightways TV. So you can go to tv.freightways.com to get all of the Floor Speed Ahead as well as all of the Freightways live content. Thank you for tuning in, Jim. Appreciate, uh, appreciate your time today.